I reckon that last song was um, written by parents. I'm tired, I'm worn, lead me home. <laughs> this morning's lesson is called On Fire, as you can, as you can see. And um, <clears throat> that's kind of my intention this morning, is hopefully to, to get us all alive again, to get us all maybe a little bit on fire. I hope to set maybe a, a spark in each of our lives. There was this boy whose parents were tired and worn and left him wandering in the streets. And he was kind of bored, not having much to do with himself. And the next minute, some excitement starts coming his way. He sees this fire engine. And he uh, jumps up and thinks, I'm going to go and see where this fire engine's going and sprints after it as fast as he can. But I mean, it's a truck and here's a boy. So he gets around the first corner and he's lost the fire engine. But all hope is not lost. He immediately, or he looks up and he sees this billowing smoke and can smell this fire. And so he runs off, follows the smoke, and just two or three blocks down the road there, he gets there as he sees the fire engine. Fire is pulling out the hoses and, and starting to douse this building with water. And the locals have already kind of gathered around this building, around the, from, the, from the neighboring houses. And um, it's unfortunately the church that has gone up in flames. A, a church that's been around for many years. And unfortunately that <clears throat> church hadn't been doing so well. The numbers had been declining. And one of the locals was heard saying, it's been a long time since I've seen that church on fire. According to the Catholic News Agency, about half of the church fires in the states over the last 20 years were set on purpose. Now, I'm not interested as to whether or not that is <coughs> fact or, or propaganda. It, it doesn't matter to me. In a very metaphorical sense, I'm hoping to on purpose or to cause each one of us to decide to set this church on fire. And when I say I want to set this church on fire, I don't mean I want the fireys to be called out. I don't mean I want to see the fire extinguishers used. And for us to look at the walls and the ceilings and the, the wood around here and to see it on fire, we are the church. And the question I want to pose to you this morning is, do you consider yourself on fire as the church of God? Many years ago, in fact approximately 2,600-ish years ago, there was this boy prince who was the eldest son of his father. And his father was a mighty warrior. In fact, his father had held his position as king for many years due to his conquests in the political arena and his ability to come out of multiple battles from the surrounding countries also wanting their prominence and dominance on the world stage. And this king, this boy, this prince at least, sorry, um, was sent out by his father, who's rumored to be ill at the time, not very well. His son was doing most of the ruling at the time, actually. And he was sent out to war against a country that was quite far away but was sort of the next threat to this empire that was emerging through the victories of his father and this boy or this crown prince probably a little bit older than a boy at this stage in his life well not probably he was annihilated this army completely decimated it in fact 
the records that remain from this victory show that not a single survivor was able to return home of this enemy that had come against, who was then known, the boy prince, as Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar returned home victorious and proved himself as not only a warrior and a victorious warrior, but one who had come to rule one of the greatest empires that ruled the world. Of course, I'm talking about the Babylonian Empire. And this king, as he became, Nebuchadnezzar, had a sort of a right to be proud of his achievements. He had won this victory as a crown prince while his dad was alive. And about 30 years later, he built this monstrous statue that was about 30 meters high. So 30 meters high, for those who are wondering, is probably from the top of that roof over there, twice that. That's about 30 meters high. It is big. And he built the statue and he set it up and he called all the peoples of the land to bow before the statue of himself because he was this ruler. He was this unparalleled, this mighty and victorious ruler of the known world. And so all the people were called and when the, the trumpets blasted and the musicians went off, everyone was to bow to the statue. And of course we know that there were three particular individuals who could hear the music and who knew the command that did not bow to that king's wishes. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And so some of the Chaldeans who were not happy that these three had been promoted so quickly to the ruler of Babylonian promise, uh, provinces, because if you remember a couple of chapters earlier, Daniel had interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh's dream of this, would you believe it, massive statue where Pharaoh was, or sorry, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was this head and shoulders of gold. And in fact, most commentators believe that's probably where he got the idea to build this statue in the first place. And so these three were the envy of the, polit of the um, political parties of the Babylonian Empire. These Jews, these captives, these these people from another country have just come in and become rulers because of the king's favor towards them. And so these certain Chaldeans took the opportunity to say, aha, look at these three men not bowing and not listening to you as the great king. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls them in. And it's an interesting sense of dynamic here because Nebuchadnezzar this all-powerful king and ruler who is in charge of everything, complete world domination in the very real sense of the world, does something interesting. He gives them another chance. I mean, that in itself would have been a surprise. But I think it had to do with the respect that these men had earned and that Daniel had earned. We're not quite sure where Daniel was, whether he was excused behind some sort of a royal pavilion that didn't have to bow to the statute when the music was played or maybe he was off on an errand or some diplomatic mission somewhere but he wasn't there but Daniel and these three men had obviously earned some sense of favor toward the king and so these three men are standing before Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar says you know what, guys we go back some ways got a friend or your friend is, is a good friend of mine helped me out when I was in a tight spot I'll give you one last chance to bow when the music goes off. And of course their response <laughs> wasn't the most diplomatic, was it? It was like, you know what, don't worry. Don't worry about playing the music again. We're just telling you, we're not going to bow before the statue. We're, we're sorry about this misunderstanding, but we're not bowing before the statue. We bow before one person, and that person is our God. And if our God wants to, he can save us from this fire. And that's always an interesting thing, and, and we've heard many lessons on that. If our God wants to, he's able to save us from this statue. But when I was going through this in, in my own personal you know, Bible studies, 
A phrase stuck out to me that I'd never really thought about before, which is really what in, in kind of started the inspiration for this morning's lesson. And they say, whether or not he saves us from this fire, doesn't matter. He will save us from you, O King. And it's interesting to me because I'd never thought about that before. You see, these people, these men understood that whether or not they were saved from that fire, which God was perfectly entitled to and able to do or not to do, they recognized that this fire was going to save them. It was going to either save them from the tyranny of the, of the Babylonian Empire that forced them to worship a God which was no God, and it was going to save them by that king, or save them from their king through death, where they recognized they would then go on to eternal life in the presence of their true creator, their true God, and they recognized that they would be saved from whatever else awaited the Jews in this land of captivity, because they would now be free. They would be free and they would be with this God whom they served and they knew who was faithful. Or God would save them from the fire and then they would still be free because Pharaoh would recognize that he could do nothing to stop the God of the universe. And so I found it really interesting that these three men looked at this, at this fire as their salvation. Truly, they were, excuse the pun, but on fire for God. These men recognized that fire for what it was. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand. And of course, as we read on, we then see Nebuchadnezzar says, well, I'm sorry, friends or no friends with Daniel, that's it. That is the wrong thing to be saying to me. I am king. I am your, I'm the one who decides your fate. And he says to his servants, heat the fire up seven times harder than what it normally is and throw them in. And I often wonder whether or not they struggled. I just believe they probably just stood there with their hands behind their back or maybe in front of them and just saying, all right, this is it. We're saved. One way or another, we don't quite know what's going on or going to happen. But their faith in God is truly inspirational. And hence, there's been so many lessons on, on that particular verse. And so this morning, I thought, as I was thinking about how I could present this in maybe a slightly different way, I thought, well, maybe I could challenge myself and each one in the audience this morning and online. Maybe I can challenge us each to be on fire for the church. And as I thought about that first point a little bit more, I thought, well, I am the church. I'm, I'm on fire for myself, well, to, to a degree, I suppose I am. But maybe let's be on fire for our brethren. Let's be on fire for each other. Let's be on fire for our enemies. Let's be on fire for our bystanders. And let's be on fire for our friends. And I want to explore those four points just a little bit this morning. Being on fire for your brethren. In Daniel chapter 3 and verse 8, we see that at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. And I'm going to use the Jews here as a symbolism for the church, the Israelites, those who were faithful, they accused the Jews for not bowing before the statue. And for whatever reason, these three men were picked out, and I believe that for whatever reason, that reason to be the fact that these men were held in a very jealous regard by the Babylonian politicians because being complete outsiders and strangers, not having done any of the groundwork that a politician is supposed to do to get to where he's at, they were just thrust into this position of power and um, favor with Nebuchadnezzar. And in Daniel chapter 3, verse 12, we see there are certain Jews who have set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And so maybe even whether or not you want to take the Jewish or the Israelites as a whole to be faithful, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were certainly an encouragement to each other. I think it would have been a lot more comforting for each one of them that the other two were there. 
I'm not taking anything away from either of them and I'm not saying any one of them would have behaved any different in a solo environment. But one thing I think that you cannot argue against is the fact that there is this sense of safety, camaraderie and strength and encouragement in numbers. I am absolutely convinced that each one of those three were extremely encouraged and uplifted and motivated to have the other two with them. And so we see these three individuals on fire for each other, helping each other to remain the course, to stay the course, to remain faithful to God. And it's interesting because we have that word and in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were all equally involved in this, even in their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded to King Nebuchadnezzar. They were one. They were on fire for each other. They were helping and encouraging their other, each other. Sorry. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Paul is telling Timothy, be encouraged by me. Take to heart my suffering and my attitude and my consistent working in spite of it and be encouraged by it. You see, I'm on fire for you, Timothy, is what Paul is saying in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. And Peter says something similar when he says, be sober, be... Uh, come on, man. Uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that, you are, that, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So we are to take courage from our brothers and sisters in the world. And if we are taking courage from them, is it not only fair that we also give courage back? that we also are on fire for them as much as they are on fire for us? How many of us have seen a preacher or a worker do something incredible and we're just inspired by them? Let us inspire others. Let us be on fire for our brethren. Let us be on fire for our enemies. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, which we read, we concentrated on the first bit in the previous point. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. So there you are, standing before the most powerful person in the world. The most influential person in the world. This is not just somebody who inherited his, father king, his father's kingdom, and he did inherit it, but this is someone who had won victories in his father's name, decimated countries in his father's name, with his own blade had gone out and won victories. This was a powerful man. He would have had an incredible sense of presence and power about him. And he brings in these captives, and these captives say to him, you know what, we don't need to answer you with this. We don't need to say anything. There is nothing for us to say to you, O king. The courage of these three men to be able to say that to Nebuchadnezzar is mind-blowing. Is absolutely mind-blowing. If you think of the most influential person in your life and I don't mean influential in terms of who maybe influences you but certainly who would put pressure on you whether that be your boss or your boss's boss or if you work for a big company the CEO of that company you know I was I worked for um, Santos for a while and um, you know we were trying to decide what to do in a particular decision that had to be made and the CEO who's like seven rungs above my boss called my boss to to tell him what to do like, that's a big thing you don't just ignore that so that was you know and he was under tremendous pressure to get to get this project done and underway now this is not just the ceo of a multi-million dollar company this is the ruler of the world and these three men stand before him as captives and just say well you know what 
we don't have to we don't have to we don't have to justify ourselves to you we know someone more powerful than you that is being on fire for your enemies or maybe i should have said before your enemies we don't need to answer you they took a stand and certainly Nebuchadnezzar responded to that stand, as you can imagine, the most powerful man in the world, the most victorious man in the world would do. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and his expression towards them changed. No longer, no longer does Daniel protect you. No longer do you have my favor. If that is how you are going to talk to me, the one who rules your very fate, well, all right. Let's see how you deal with that. So certainly his response was as expected. And the result in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. For they have frustrated the king's word and healed at their bodies that they should not go up or serve or worship any God except their own God. And this is where I think Nebuchadnezzar differs so much from Pharaoh. If you consider Pharaoh in the Exodus, how he caused his country to be annihilated through his pride. But Nebuchadnezzar, every time he was shown up, or every time he was proven wrong in the eyes of the Almighty God, he just said, Yep, my bad. Anyone who says anything about the God of Daniel, uh, you, you're, you're on my bad side now because... Clearly something's going on. It happened when Daniel spoke to him about his dream. It happened, yeah, when these three men walked out of the furnace unscathed and untouched. And it happened when God had humbled him after he had walked on the, on the wall of his temple and said, this is all that I have made. And God says, tonight I'll take the, the, the kingdom from you. And he does. And about seven-ish years later, he gets restored back to king of Babylon. And he says, praise be to the God most high. Every time Nebuchadnezzar was humbled, he yielded to that humility and, and didn't try and kick against it as Pharaoh did. And so we see here standing up, being on fire for your enemies had a definite result um, in the life of Pharaoh, in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar, sorry. And certainly um, Paul calls for the same thing when he's writing to Titus. And he writes to Titus in verses, chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, and he says, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptible, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. You see, being on fire, doing things right, doing things right by God before men, even your opponents will have to concede victory because God is truth. His way is truth. And yes, men will kick against the goads. Pharaoh kicked against the goads. Nebuchadnezzar kept falling back to his proud ways. But ultimately, those who stand for God will be delivered. In this life, maybe, but especially the next. And being on fire for God, for your enemies, it will cause them to look on you and on God with a new light. How does this person do this? Whoopsie. How does this person do this? Matthew chapter 5 verse 43 through 44. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be sons of of your father in heaven Jesus also teaches well not also Jesus teaches and so I suppose Paul did when he wrote to Titus but Jesus teaches us to love our enemies to be on fire for God for our enemies that hopefully they may recognize this truth see this difference and question and ask well why is this person doing this this is not how an enemy should be behaving what is the difference? That's the idea behind it. Being on fire for your bystanders. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 27, the satraps, administrators, governors, and king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose body the fire had no power. These men also recognized they were bystanders. They didn't bring uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. They didn't accuse them. But they recognized 
the power of God on them. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith had an effect on those who were standing by as well. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard that my chains are in Christ. And the brethren in the Lord have become confident in my chains. So there we see a little bit of both. We see Paul's fire for Christ having an effect on the palace guard. And what we looked at in the first point, also the brethren, his um, his being on fire had an effect on the brethren, so being on fire for the brethren as well. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So our light into this world has an effect on those, or can and should have an effect on those who are just bystanders. And in, and in looking at this, there's, there's quite a lot, there's definitely a psychological movement around the bystander, they call it the bystander effect, where you will always have some people as bystanders that don't agree with you but support you, and then you will always have bystanders that just don't care either way, and then you will always have bystanders that are just actively against you. So whatever the, wherever they fall, it doesn't matter, it's us being on fire for Christ, that ultimately Christ's light shines into the world. And then on fire for your friends. Be on fire for your friends. And you might, if you particularly have a, if you have a particular eye for detail, you'd have noticed that every time I've written on fire for your friends, it's been in italics. And that is because this is a little bit inferred in the passage. I couldn't really find anything in there that actually says, oh, you know, all the friends of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were influenced by this. But I kind of inferred it, if you'll allow me a little uh, poetic license. Uh, firstly, we see that certain Chaldeans brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that means that there were others that didn't mind or that didn't care. And they might fall into the, might fall into the bystander category, maybe. But I thought I'd cross-reference that with Daniel chapter 1, verse 9, where the chief eunuch actually finds favor with Daniel. He's, he's like, I want to help you, but I'm kind of tired because like, my life's on the line here. And Daniel gives them away. We'll just test us, see where it goes. And so we see that there were some people in and around these Jews, these four men that were faithful to God and were kicking against King Nebuchadnezzar's commands when they contradicted their faith and service to God, uh, that found favor with them, that actually wanted to be a part of their lives. And I, th I found this in, in the New Testament as well. We see in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, where Paul is talking about this fellowship, where he actually says, I'm not talking about those in the world who behave in a sexually immoral or um, morally unethical way, because in that case, you'd have to leave the world. In other words, he's saying, it's like, I understand you're going to have to have dealings with and relationships with people who are unfaithful and immoral and, and unethical and all of those things, because to not is impossible. You have to, you have to leave the world. Is what he's saying there and then another passage that I found really interesting I'd never noticed this before and I might be reading a little more into it than I should but in Acts chapter 19 verse 30 through 31 remember Paul was a very influential outstanding top of his class if there was something like this awarded probably would have been awarded most likely to succeed Pharisee of his day he was taught under Gamaliel. He had a, a whole bright pharisaical future ahead of him. And then he became a Christian. And certainly the traits that he had as this Pharisee wouldn't have changed. In fact, we see that they didn't change. When he was a Pharisee, he was a dead set, zealous, on fire Pharisee. He was going to persecute anybody that contradicted his religion and what he believed to be true. But when his eyes were opened, when he recognized what truth was, he was a dead set, on fire Christian to do everything he could for what he recognized to now be true. So his character, his mindset, his upbringing to, to search for and to walk in accordance with what was true hadn't changed. And so anybody that respected or enjoyed or liked Paul as a person and as a friend, for that friendship's sake, it appears they didn't leave him. And we see that in Acts chapter 19, uh, 30 through 31. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, so there, this, there was this massive riot going on, and he wanted to go into, this, to this, into the midst of everything and calm everyone down, 
The disciples would not allow him, firstly, but then also some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him saying, please don't go in there. You will die. So it's not only the disciples, but also his friends. So his friends recognized this fire of Paul. So Paul, we could see, was on fire for his brethren, was on fire for his enemies, was on fire for the bystanders, was on fire for his friends. And so I hope that you are challenged to either be a girl on fire, if you know the Alicia Keys song or Hunger Games theme, or the boy that is on fire. Well, apparently that's written by Once Monsters. I didn't listen to that song, so I hope there's nothing dodgy in it. But, you know, that, that lyric came up, and that's the point, is that we be on fire for Christ. We are servants of Christ. If any one of us suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. What does it mean to be on fire. What does being on fire look like? If we were in a, in a Bible study setting, I'd maybe go around and ask each of you, what does it mean to be on fire? And I'm sure I'd hear things like, well, to sing loudly during the service, to show my praise to God when singing to Him, to pray, to read, to study. You know, when I do the, I do the little devotion, sort of small group things at Boys Brigade, we each break off after the devotion, do the small group discussions. Everyone knows the Sunday school answers. But I want to challenge you all to not only know the answers, but to be on fire for Christ, for God, for His church, for us, for our brethren, for our enemies, for the world. And for our friends. I pray that this has encouraged you to be on fire. I thought, I was laughing when Joseph said it, I couldn't not do it. What does it mean to be on fire? The Collins Dictionary says, They were on fire to prove themselves to be eager, ardent, and zealous. Let us be eager, ardent, and zealous to serve our Lord and God in the manner that He calls us to serve Him. His love.